Next on the program, I'd like to introduce Mr. Alan Corwin. Uh, he's a nationally recognized gun law expert based here in Phoenix. He's a founder and past president of the Arizona Book Publishing Association and a former board member of the Society of Professional Journalists, Journalists in Phoenix. His clients include IBM, American Express, Intel, and anyone else with a checkbook and a bank guarantee card. He is, he is a frequent guest on radio talk shows and is on the Speakers Bureau for Washington, D.C. based Accuracy in Media. He is the author of the Arizona Gun Owner's Guide and similar books for California, Florida, Texas, and Virginia. It's too fast for me. I'll go, go slower. <laughs> we rehearsed this last night, but I'm lousy with rehearsals. Uh, he's lying to you. Uh, and his latest, The Heller Case, Gun Rights Affirmed. He's the publisher at Bloomfield Press, That's okay. the nation's largest publisher and distributor of gun law books. Allen had a reserve seat at the U.S. Supreme Court for the recent Heller case. Uh, that would have been fun. Oh, it was great. Was which, uh, which declared self-defense a fundamental human right, and that's his topic for today. Please help me welcome Alan Corwin. Thank you. He did great. He did great, don't you think? Yeah. <clears throat> How many of you were at the barbecue and saw my band, The Cartridge Family? <clears throat> Wasn't that fun? We get, we get a kick out of doing that. We put together some doctor songs just for you folks. So they've got me here to wrap up, huh? End of the day, was it a good conference? Yeah. yeah. Do you have plans for the rest of your time in Phoenix? Are you fly how who's flying out like right after this? A couple. Who's here, you know, for the next day or two? Some of you? Oh, that's great. You know, the biggest gun show in Arizona is being held right now down at the uh, Phoenix Fairgrounds at the corner of McDowell and 19th Avenue. I'll be leaving here right after this talk to get down there and autograph books. And how many of you have never been to a gun show? Probably a lot. Man, you are missing something fabulous. This is free markets at work. Everything is open tables like it is here so you can see everybody. And you see all the business being transpired. There are something like a thousand tables in four huge rooms and a tent. And they're selling guns and ammo, of course. It's a free country. You can own a firearm in this country. But they're selling t-shirts and sunglasses and toys you will not find at Toys R Us. Toys that explode, dart guns, you know, things that you played with when you were a kid. Um, jewelry, uh, foods, weird foods, survival gear, and it's all cash and carry. It's quite an amazing experience. And if you want to do something while you're here in Phoenix, go on down to the crossroads of the West Gun Show. You'll get a kick out of that. Uh, there's always rumors that there are government agents at gun shows walking around looking like bubbles, you know, with a t-shirt with a hole in it and a, a burn and a stain and it says, kill them all, let God sort them out. And they actually sell that shirt at the show if you're so inclined. Um, but there's no agents at the door doing any sort of thing, at least not here in Arizona. Arizona is a very free state. Uh, here the ownership of a firearm is the ownership of private property. And that's basically how it's handled. Uh, one of your fellows came out and we were talking in the lobby about selling a gun. He's got a gun he doesn't want. And this may seem a little weird to you because most of what you hear about firearms you get from the news. And everything you get from firearms in the news is wrong. I'll go into that in a little bit of detail. But you only see crime. You, th there's going to be 15 or 20,000 people go through this gun show and there won't be any reports on it. And his family's pushing strollers and kids having ice cream and, you know, it's a family event. In fact, did you see that HIPAA t-shirt they had out there where the doctors bent over and Uncle Sam's, it was stick figures. Did you see that? It was kind of cute. You couldn't wear that at the gun show. They wouldn't allow it. It's family values. So things that are obscene or bizarre that way aren't allowed. And yet there's firearms everywhere. Thousands of people go through, nobody gets shot, there's no crimes committed, everything's legal, decent, open, and above board. And the fellow was asking, what do I have to do to sell a gun? So I said, well, what kind of gun and how much money do you want for it? <laughs> it's private property. And this is an alien concept, isn't it? You hear about guns and crime. <clears throat> guns save lives. 
Guns stop crime. Guns keep you safe. Guns are good. That's why we give them to the police. That's why the military has them. That's why we, the people, have firearms, because guns are good. And you don't get that in the news, do you? Guns are why America is still free. And guns are what keep us free and hold our enemies at bay. The Marines have a simple phrase for it. They say, peace through superior firepower. There are people who would take your stuff. If guns magically went away, we would have to reinvent them to protect ourselves. So I'm still going to offer money to this guy for the gun he wants to sell. And no crime is committed. Nobody's harmed. There's no victim. Every time they come up with an idea for a new gun law, you ask yourself, who's the victim they're trying to protect? Or are they just making it harder for you to have a firearm? Now, if you're from out of state, there is a federal law that prevents you from buying a handgun out of your home state. You can actually arrange it by having the dealer ship it to your home state, but you can't actually buy it. But if one of the members of my band or one of you who lives here in Arizona has a gun you want to sell to me, I'm perfectly free to buy it. There's no paperwork. There's no waiting period. It's the private transfer of property. And that's probably a pretty tough concept for some of you to think of because all you hear is guns are bad. There was a story the other day in the paper about a shooting in Kentucky, in a convenience store in Kentucky. That's not news in Arizona. One criminal act in Kentucky is not news in Arizona 2,000 miles away, 2,500 miles away. But the media runs it so that you'll be scared, so that you'll think guns are bad, and they don't run the story about the man who saved his life in Kentucky who should be a hero, who should be on the front page of the paper. Self-defense saves another human life. The people who would take your guns away have no compassion for the lives of the innocent in that situation. One of the books we sell, and I guess I, hmm, I'm not doing this as organized as I should. I'll leave these up here. This is a, a catalog with 160 books we now carry. One of the books covers 13 scholarly studies. Oh, that's a great idea. Here, so I have two piles. Thank you. One of the books we sell covers the 13 scholarly studies on self-defense use of firearms. 13 scholarly studies. These are peer-reviewed studies. One of them was done by the Clinton Justice Department. They find between 700,000 and two, he'll get to you, put your hand down, he'll get to you. One of them finds between 700,000 and 2.5 million defensive gun uses a year, DGUs, defensive gun uses. And the, the different uh, counts is because they took different time periods, different sets of respondents, they asked different questions. Did you use a gun in the past year? Did you use a gun in your life? Did you fire the gun? Did you just present the gun? Did you just mention that you have a gun to stop a confrontation? And the two and a half million figures, several studies show, that's about how many times a firearm prevents crime in this country. Le two and a half million. That's the CLEC study out of the University of Florida, or Florida University, I get that backwards. Um, two and a half million times a year, but have you seen it? Have you heard it? Do you, do you even know that this exists? It is suppressed. It's hidden from you by the news media. If they ran those stories, you'd have a different impression of guns. You'd have a different impression of freedom. You'd have a different understanding of private property and your right to defend yourself. I knew a reporter who worked for the Associated Press in Cleveland, I think it was Cleveland, and he had a story on self-defense, a man who saved his life with a gun, perfectly legitimate self-defense shooting, and the AP chief wouldn't run it. He wouldn't run the story. And the reporter asked them why, and it was a good story. He said, because if I run that story, it might suggest to people that they copycat and imitate that behavior. If we tell people that people save their lives with firearms, somebody else might do it. But 15 years later, they're still talking about Columbine, aren't they? That's still a standard model for them. 1,500 people a year die falling down in their bathtubs. A dozen people died at Columbine a, a decade and a half ago, and what is the media giving you? They're distorting the image, 
They're making you think self-defense is something you do with a cell phone. You call the police with your cell phone. Cell phones and 911, folks, is government-sponsored dial-a-prayer. If somebody comes in this room and starts shooting, you better hope that one of your fellow colleagues has a gun in his pocket and can react. We sell four books that are nothing but stories of people who have protected their lives with guns. Nothing but stories, and the media doesn't run them. John Lott has a book called The Bias Against Guns which is a, he's an economist, and formerly with the American Enterprise Institute, now he's with the University of Maryland. I think he did this study while he was with Yale. He counted the words in the major media on gun crime and defensive gun use. USA Today, 6,500 words on gun crime, not a single word on defensive gun use, not one. New York Times, over 50,000 words on gun-related crime, and a single story with 163 words in it about an off-duty cop who stopped a burglary with his backup gun. And that's the story you're getting. Two and a half million defensive gun uses, no news, anti-news, a, a shooting in Kentucky being shown to you 2,500 miles away. It's tragic. It's criminal. And your right to defend yourself should be inviolate. It's in the Bill of Rights, the Heller case found at its core that self-defense is a fundamental human right. Let me tell you a story. A friend of mine was arrested recently in the California desert for eating a condor. And when he went to court, the judge was ready to throw the book at him. He says, how could you do that to this majestic bird? It's an endangered species. How could you eat it? And my friend said, Your Honor, this bird swooped down out of the sky at me and attacked me. And look at the gash in my arm. I had a fight of my life. And when it was over, I, I couldn't just leave it there, so I ate it. And, and the judge says, you know, that, that's a pretty good story. All right, not guilty, case dismissed. And as my friend's leaving, the doctor says, you know, the, the uh, doctor. The judge says, you know, I'm curious, what does a condor taste like? And my friend says, I don't know. It's kind of a cross between a bald eagle and a spotted owl. Now, I tell that for a reason, aside from getting the laugh, which is always nice. Um, things are not always what they seem, and the news media follows that model precisely. I'll give you another example that you'll relate to. You ever see the ads for hamburgers on TV or on billboards especially, or even in the fast food shops? The burgers like this has got a thick slab of meat and a big chunk of juicy tomato with pieces of onion and dripping with cheese and lettuce, and it's just like this. But when they deliver the hamburger, the top bun touches the bottom bun. And you don't say anything. You say, hmm. You should say, huh, I want that burger, and point to the picture. They're selling you a horse and delivering a mule, and you don't notice. You've been drubbed over the head so much, you don't connect the dots when they're right in front of you. You've been hamburgerized. You've been hamburgerized. And the news media does that to you all the time, and you should be able to connect the dots yourself fairly easily. But you sort of got to open your eyes, you've got to step back, you've got to look at it with a different perspective. When they yell and scream about assault weapons. You've heard this many times, right? Assault weapons are bad. But you're doctors, you're a fairly bright crowd compared to some of the folks I speak to. Assault is a kind of behavior. It's not a kind of hardware. It's a kind of behavior. Assault happens with or without a gun. Bill Clinton introduced that term. It's a great term. From a public relations perspective and a news media perspective, it vilifies guns, it makes guns sound bad. We should at least ban those guns. Uh, we didn't do the song at the barbecue where we talk about they, they just want to ban the little guns. We're just going to ban the little guns. Assault is a kind of behavior. You point any gun at me, and that's assault. They talk about cop killer bullets. 
Well, any bullet you fire at a cop is a cop killer bullet. And then they tell you the NRA supports armor piercing ammunition, which was a total lie, total fabrication. What happened was the Brady people, the ones who want to ban guns, which is really banning your right to self-defense, they wanted to ban lubricated ammunition. Now, because lubricated ammunition can go through a protective vest, well, not really. Depends on the vest, depends on the ammunition. Shooting at a cop ought to be attempted murder and you go to jail for 20 years, right? We should pass that law. Oh, we did pass that law, I remember now, I wrote the book. It's illegal to shoot at a cop. It shouldn't be any more illegal to shoot at a cop than to shoot at me, right? Uh, unless the cops are special agents of the government and they have special rights and protections that you don't have, that would be wrong. A f shot fired at another human being should be a very serious crime, and it is. And if you use this kind of ammo or that kind of ammo, you shouldn't get off easy because it's the news media vilified bullet instead of the plain, ordinary, normal bullet. And using deception, the Brady's wanted to outlaw lubricated bullets, which is all bullets made. They were gonna use deception and deceit to outlaw ammunition by outlawing lubricated bullets, and the news media fell in line straight away and said, we've gotta outlaw these cop killer bullets and nobody connected the dots, and nobody in the media pointed out what I'm telling you, and here's the irony. The law that outlaws true armor-piercing ammunition, and there is such a thing, it's ammunition with a core of steel or certain other characteristics specifically designed to penetrate metal armor or flexible armor that people wear, that law was written by the NRA. And you didn't know that, did you? The NRA wrote the law that outlawed armor-piercing ammunition because otherwise the law that banned lubricated ammunition would have passed and you could have your gun, but you couldn't have bullets. And that's what the antis are looking to do. That's what they're looking to do. Uh, the basic principle is guns are okay as long as they don't work. And that's what they had in Washington, D.C. That's what this Heller case was about. This book, by the way, is on press right now. It comes off press next week. I was there, at, I was a guest of the court. I was very lucky because I had written Supreme Court gun cases, an unabridged guide to the 92 cases the Supreme Court has heard on guns. Now you probably heard that this was the first case since Miller. Well, this was the only case that dealt with the Second Amendment. Another complete fabrication. This was the 64th gun case since the Miller case in 1939. They want you to believe what they want you to believe, and the news media is backing them up every step of the way. The NRA wrote the bill to ban the ammo, and people think the NRA supports cop killer bullets and armor-piercing ammunition. Now, there is a group that's fighting this, and I think Don was here. How many of you met Don Irvine while he was here? A few. There's a man who is campaigning on a very just cause. Accuracy in Media, based in Washington, D.C., exposes the BS that goes on in the press. They hold these people's feet to the fire. And you can sign up for free at aim.org, and I recommend that you do. They will tell you about what's going on with Islamofascism, the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, the books that come out that are bogus, the leaders of the news media who deliberately campaign to mislead you. It's aim.org, couldn't be simpler. They take donations, they have a newsletter, they send you postcards addressed to the head of NBC, the head of the n networks, and you can put a postage stamp on there and sign them and send them in, and these people know they're being watched. They go to the annual meetings and they speak out when the brass is actually exposed to the public. And it is so important to do. As a writer, as a 20-year member of the Society of Professional Journalists, I am humiliated by some of what they do. Um, in fact, I do a blog on that. If you go to this, uh, send me an email, I'll add you to the blog list. Um, Society of Professional Journalists just put out a notice about Muslims. You're not supposed to use the word Islamofascist in any news story. That's the recommended verbiage. 
<clears throat> you're not supposed to say Muslim terrorist or connect Muslim or Islam with any negative adjective. And it's on their website. These are the rules. That's why <clears throat> the Islamo-fascists are running a war on terror against us, and we don't get any news about it. We hear insurgents. We hear battles. They, they hide and disguise what's actually going on. Let me get back to guns for a minute, and then I'll go into the heart of self-defense, and then if we have some time, we'll take some questions. I, I am not going to stick around autograph books today because nobody's watching my table down at the gun show, but it's a, very, it's a very safe place. You know, occasionally a gangbanger comes through and lifts something off a table, but generally the security down there, people put a rag across the table. They got $60,000 worth of guns on a table, and at night they cover it with a rag, and in the morning they come in and do business. I'm telling you, if you've never seen one of these, it's worth going. You'll buy some beef jerky at the very least. At the heart of it, I'm a utopian pacifist. I'm hoping for a world of complete peace and abundance and prosperity with no strife, war, or weapons of any kind on the surface of the earth. That's what I would like to see. That's the ultimate goal. And the thing that prevents us from getting there is what I call the four horsemen of human havoc. And that's angry, hungry, stupid, and wicked. And they're out there. And that's the nature of human beings. Angry, hungry, stupid, and wicked. Now, hungry might be solvable. There's people who say hunger could be ended. And I suppose theoretically that's possible. But angry? Stupid? Is there a, you're doctors, is there a cure for stupid? It's incurable. And nobody understands it. And wicked? There are people out there who are wicked. They just are. I mean, there's crazies too. And you can't really call them wicked, maybe. But they can be pretty bad. And until we solve the problem of the four horsemen of human havoc, we're stuck having to defend ourselves. And that brings the gun issue into a very interesting focus because you can, you can imagine a world without guns. It's actually easy. The anti-rights people would love to have a world without guns. Wave a wand. Outlaw guns in the United States. Now, actually, we have outlawed guns in the United States for criminals, right? But it doesn't work. It never has worked. We've outlawed drugs. And you can buy any kind of drug you want, 24 hours a day, in any American city, in any quantity. And so we're going to pour more money into the drug war, and you'll still be able to buy whatever you want, new drugs, old drugs. I haven't heard much about opium lately. Can you still get opium out there? We could outlaw guns. Well, we have. We've outlawed it for the criminals. So the only thing left is the out outlaw guns for you guys. Let's outlaw guns for the innocent. That's another connect the dots problem. I have a button that says disarm criminals first, right? So let's have no guns of any kind on the face of the earth, bad guys first. We can't seem to get there. But you can picture a gun-free world. It's very easy to do. Although if you just outlawed guns in the United States, I guarantee you the communist Chinese would flood the market with guns. And so would the Brazilians, and so would the Italians, and so would the Peruvians, and, every, and the Russians. Everybody who makes guns would sneak them in here the same as they're sneaking in drugs. And if you don't like the war on some drugs, you're going to hate the war on guns. That's going to be far worse than the war on some drugs. But you can imagine a, a gun-free world. It's very easy. You go back in time a little ways. Guns were only invented the 1500s, 1600s, prior to that. There were no guns. It was a gun-free world. It was just what we wanted. So how far back should we go? Cain slew Abel with a rock. Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great. They wiped out entire towns, raped, pillaged, plundered, burned everything to the ground, no guns. And in fact, that's when you really needed a gun. And not just a six-shooter. When the hordes came to town, you needed belt-fed, water-cooled, and a bunch of guys with you. That's what you needed, and that's what guns are for. That's guns save lives, guns stop crime, guns are good. 
And the amazing part, guns are fun. How many of you have ever heard anybody say guns are fun? Oh, an enlightened crowd. I feel at home already. People will say, what do you need a machine gun for? Well, you don't ever want to be in a situation where you need a machine gun. If there's people coming through the neighborhood raping and pillaging, burning houses down and dragging families out and that kind of civil disorder erupts, you don't want a six shooter, you want a machine gun. And you never want to need a machine gun. But why do people want machine guns? Because they're fun. You ain't had fun till you fired a machine gun. We have machine gun shoots here in Arizona. They're popular events. Nobody gets killed, no crime is committed, everybody goes home at the end of the day, and it is just fun. We had a shoot like that at the Ben Avery Range. 26,000 people went through the outdoor Ben Avery Range on two days. A Jeep was there with a mountain of boulders and you could drive their Jeep up and down the mountain. They were selling sausages like at any street fair. Kids had ice cream and gunfire the entire time. All over here, there's booths selling clothing and antique gear and all sorts of stuff. And all across there on the firing line, the manufacturers had their new guns out and you could shoot them for free. You could shoot cowboy action. You could shoot one shot 22 and show your nine year old how it's done and have this great picture of a soccer mom trying to get the photo of the instructor and the nine year old and the target. And she's there concentrating, learning this great American sport, how to shoot. And then down here, the biggest lines were at the machine gun booth. They had a fully automatic AK-47. They had a belt-fed 30 caliber. That is my favorite gun. And they had a hand crank Gatling gun. Big brass reproduction hand crank Gatling gun. Shoots a bullet. It, you know, you need two guys to lift the bullets and load them. It was just fun. The sound it makes, the vibration it gives you. And it's a wholesome sport. Here's a little fact that the news media doesn't really give you. The shooting sports are now the number two most popular sport in the country based on equipment sales. They've just edged by golf. Golf used to be number two. Now golf is number three and shooting sports is number two. Anybody want to guess what number one is? NASCAR. NASCAR. That's a good guess, but no, that's not it. It's exercise equipment. Exercise equipment is number one by almost a factor of two. It's about five and a half billion a year. Uh, guns are three point something and golf is now three point something less. So shooting is the number two consumer athletic uh, uh, sport in the nation. And do you hear that at all? You hear Tiger Woods, right? You hear the LGPA and the 19th hole drunkenness and, and the PGA and the Masters Tour. You hear all that, right? But you don't hear Browning has a new shotgun with better wood and better sights. You don't hear Kimber has a new firearm with a better safety and it's more accurate and it's easier to clean. You get no new product news on firearms, absolutely none. And they're constantly making new and improved products. You go down to the gun show, there's guns everywhere you turn. Thousands and thousands of people, you get no news. So how does this all tie into self-defense? The uh, Heller case, did I mention that this book is coming out next week? <laughs> this will be the first book out on the Heller case. We worked our butts off. I have 20 different experts in there, including a number of uh, medical doctors, one out of Harvard, uh, uh, Fred Bieber, um, and uh, Bruce Eimer who maybe some of you know Bruce, he's a uh, psychiatrist, a uh, clinical psychiatrist, and he did a piece on gun hatred and hoplophobia. Hoplophobia, how many people have heard the term hoplophobia? A precious few. The rest of you need to get on my email list. Hoplophobia is a medical condition. It's fear of guns, fear of weapons. It comes from the Greek hoplite. Uh, some people who hate guns, and there's a lot of gun hatred out there, are actually have a morbid fear of weapons. They sweat, they faint, they get nauseous, they can't go near guns. The mention of a gun raises their blood pressure. It's a disease we're dealing with, an undiagnosed disease. And in fact, there's a handful of doctors working on getting hoplophobia into the, will I get the initials right? DM? DSM. DSM. Uh, the DSM doesn't recognize hoplophobia right now. 
but I've seen people with it. People afraid to get out of their car when you bring them to the range. Afraid to get out of their car. And here's all these people shooting, it's perfectly normal, it's perfectly safe. It's one of the safest sports when you look at the 30,000 kids who've gone through the Scholastic Clays program, they all go through. You look at the kids who went through soccer and football and they're in the emergency rooms every single week. And the media doesn't make that point either, do, do they? Well, <clears throat> folks have hoplophobia and Bruce Imer wrote a piece on it in the Heller case because the thing the Heller case decided, Washington DC said you can have a gun as long as it doesn't work. It was that formula again. The gun had to be disassembled or locked up and could not be loaded even if you were being attacked in your own home. <clears throat> so a criminal could come in with a gun. The law didn't apply to criminals. The different laws applied to them. <clears throat> your gun had to be inoperable. And not just inoperable. Unloaded is enough of a restriction. It had to be in pieces. Or if it wasn't in, in pieces, it had to be locked up. And the court looked at that and said, is this, does the Second Amendment protect anything? Does the right of the people to keep and bear arms protect anything? Does a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed? Does that mean anything? And if it means anything, does it mean a completely inoperable gun in your home, even if you're being attacked? And by a five to four decision, the court said, that goes too far. The Second Amendment at least protects self-defense in your home, and self-defense is a core, fundamental human right. That's what the Supreme Court decided by a single vote. We could have lost the Second Amendment by one vote. Now for 220 some odd years, 228 now, for 200 some odd years, we've had this right, we've exercised this right. I can sell a gun to one of you, you can sell a gun to one of me, the gun show is on. We have case after case after case of legitimate self-defense where the Supreme Court says that's okay. There were cases in the 1890s, I love them. There's, uh, there's one where a guy finds a man climbing in his wife's bedroom window at two in the morning and he goes over with a gun to investigate and the guy turns on him with a knife. So he takes out his gun, shoots him and kills him. And then he's scared and runs away. They catch him in St. Louis, bring him to trial, convict him of murder because he instigated the fight by going over. And when the guy turned with a knife, he should have run away. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's not the way we do it in America. If somebody's climbing in your wife's bedroom window at two in the morning, it's perfectly natural, that was their phrase, perfectly natural to go over and investigate. And if the guy turns on you and offers deadly force in this country, you can stand your ground and return deadly force to protect your life. And the fact that you ran away is not an indication of your guilt. In fact, they said there were a lot of reasons why a person would run away. The cost, the social opprobrium, I think that was the word they used, uh, the, the chance that you might not be found innocent. There were plenty of reasons why a person would run away after. That's a question for the jury to decide. And they acquitted him, nine to nothing. And it was case after case like that. It was just marvelous. So the court has recognized it, and now they have officially said, you have a right to keep a real firearm operable in your home, and self-defense is a core human right. But here's the real conflict. My co-author on this book, Dave Copel, who's an absolute genius, and will be here, by the way, for the Gun Rights Policy Conference the end of this month. How many of you are locals? Some? The uh, Gun Rights Policy Conference is the big national get-together of all the movers and shakers in the self-defense and firearms uh, uh, what do you call it, issue, movement, the freedom movement, the firearms movement. We'll all be here on uh, I-10 and Dunlap, September 26, 27, and 28. He'll be there talking about this book, and he wrote a paper for the Notre Dame Law Review. He's written dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed law review articles. And this Notre Dame article, written with two co-authors, was entitled, Is Self-Defense a Human Right? Fair enough question, nobody ever asked it. Is self-defense a human right? And he looked at what goes on around the world and the unfortunate conclusion is that it is not. It ought to be, but it is not. There's genocide going on in Sudan. Can you go in there and stop it? No. If you sneak firearms in to help the people being exterminated 
can you do that? The United States won't let you ship the arms. And the Sudanese government finds you doing that, they'll execute you. No due process, no rule of law. You're helping the rebels. There's no way to protect the people who are under genocide from the genocide. The United Nations doesn't recognize it. It takes the United Nations years to issue a proclamation that we don't approve of this. Will they go in and stop them? They haven't. The genocides go on without them. They go in and promise protection and then pull out, and the genocides continue. And unfortunately, although self-defense should be a human right, and it should be on the front page of the news all the time to encourage us to be independent, self-reliant, freedom-loving, the type of spirit and guts that Americans typically have, isn't recognized globally and is barely recognized here. We won the Heller case by one vote. One vote the other way and self-defense would not be recognized. And the antis would win that battle. That's why it's important for you, even though medicine is your main concern, and maybe some of you see the horrors that go on from the drug war that make their way into your hospital emergency rooms, the right of the individual person to keep and bear arms must remain inviolate. And you should go down to the gun show and have a good time and revel in this freedom that we enjoy. And on that note, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Oh, I have a picture of a big hamburger. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, good morning. Um, I have a question. Getting back to the drug wars in the urban areas. It's just not located to urban areas. I've practiced in the rural areas and had drug issues there as well. Um, now obviously in terms of with the gun control laws, again, you mentioned with the criminals and it's trying to target the criminals. And when people oppose, um, or they have you know, obviously serious issues with the Second Amendment, they, they cite the issues of the things that are going on in terms of the drug wars and with the criminals, uh, guns in hand. Now let me step back, but I will ask, I'm just, I'm, I'm You have a question giving, coming, yeah, I can tell. I have a tell. question, yeah. <clears throat> now I'm originally from Philadelphia. Currently in Philadelphia, yeah. <clears throat> there is not one gunsmith shop. So and then the question is, where are these drugs, where are these guns coming from? Same place as the drugs. You almost answered your question. Well, yes. And that is, I think that's really the larger picture. Even the uh, Department of Justice pointed that out. And I think that was probably, probably part of what the Brady thing when they initiated the studies. So the question, getting down to the question, how would, would you respond to that situation to the people say, well, we have to have gun control because this, is, you know, this situation is unfolding. What would your solutions to that situation be, or your proposed solutions? Thank you very much. An interesting four or five questions in that. Um, and I gave a speech at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, and the Philadelphia thing came up. It was a major issue. What is the real problem we're facing here? There's a law enforcement component that gets overlooked. The criminals have guns, and we can't seem to disarm them. We can't stop them from getting the guns. We passed all the laws, right? We have all the laws to keep the criminals from buying guns, possessing guns, using guns, from anybody using a gun in any criminal fashion, and law enforcement doesn't help. Then, according to the folks at that speech at Duquesne, the judicial system's completely broken. We catch these people, we bring them in, and they're right out on the street again. We take their gun away, and they just get another one. So we're actually bolstering the gun industry by taking guns from the criminals, and then they go get more. So the gun law, the gun control component, is not the component that's broken. All the laws have been passed. And gun control, by the way, has become a synonym for disarm the public. It doesn't mean disarm the criminal, right? Disarm criminals first. That's the plan. Let's pass laws so we can disarm criminals. We've passed every law you could possibly want to do that. I've written eight books on it. The laws are there. Law enforcement can't do it. The drug component's a very important one, and the Baltimore Sun published a map, which I have up on my website, gunlaws.com. It's not this diverse gun problem. 
it's a demographic, geographic, socioeconomic problem. The shootings you hear about all the time are people with prior criminal records, people who know each other, and according to a police officer who spoke just before me uh, last week at Jewish Community Center, he said 80% of all the gun stuff he sees is drug related. The war on some drugs is causing war deaths. Not gun deaths, but war deaths. And the camps are armed, and they shoot at each other, and we have war deaths. You want to stop the war deaths? It's time to declare an armistice. Let's have a truce. Look at all the trouble alcohol causes, but we don't have people shooting each other or a black market sneaking in beer. We might have tons of problems with the drug situation, which we do, but on top of it, we have the criminal element running the economic portion. Baltimore has a map of gun deaths that you, it's an interactive map, fabulous thing. You can say, show me all the gun deaths for this year, this year, this year, this age group, male, female, white, black, Hispanic, and other. So you say, show me all the gun deaths for 2007 in Baltimore, and the map is just full of dots all in this section. No dots over here. They're all over here. Well, show me all the deaths of blacks in 2007, and the map looks almost identical. Then you say, show me the map for all the white deaths in 2007. And these are victims, not shooters. We don't know who the shooters are. And you say, show me the white deaths for 2007. And it's like nine pins in the map, all in the same area, but only some. And the pins are in color for shooting, bludgeoning, stabbing, and other. They, they, have, they break it out. You have all these black people being killed in one part of town and a few white people being killed, and even less Hispanics. Now, maybe Baltimore has a population that's disproportionate. I actually looked into that. It's not that disproportionate. But the gun problem is a demographic and geographic and social problem and a drug-related problem, and it has nothing to do with all of us in here who own guns. But you get this impression that it's an amorphous, homogenous, generalized gun problem because guns are bad, because as... Uh, uh, Mayor Koch said in New York, if you have a gun, you're not a nice guy, even if you're a nice guy. How can a person be so ignorant? He's got bodyguards. He's got police officers. His chief of police all have guns. They're nice people, just like us, just like the 12,000 who will go through the gun show today and tomorrow. So that's the answer to why Philadelphia has a problem. You can't get a gun in Philly, and they don't grow cocaine in Philly either, but you can sure get all the cocaine you want in Philly, and it's good shit. <laughs> yes, sir. Did I, did I answer say. your question? You should see that map at gunlaws.com. Uh, th there's a blue button right on the home page for gun demographics. I was just going to say what you were saying about challenging people at public speaking events who are saying something wrong and getting aggressive in the challenging, challenging about our rights and things like that. There's a guy by the name of Ray McGovern who was a CIA analyst who goes to New York 9-11 truth meetings and he wrote the President's Daily Brief for Presidents Nixon, uh, Ford, and Reagan and he very aggressively challenged Donald Rumsfeld at a meeting. He told him he was lying about the invasion of Tikrit and Donald Rumsfeld was just sort of, he couldn't do anything about it. They're not going to drag him out. They send somebody over. But people need to challenge these people very aggressively. And that needs to be done in public speaking. Well, thank you. And AAPS does that too. AAPS. I wish your membership was 100 times the size it is because you guys are on target. You see what the government's doing with Medicare and health care and lying. We have $60 trillion in unfunded debt, much of it for health care, and none of the candidates talk about it. You guys are aware of it, and it's important to get out there. I, I do a talk on free publicity, which maybe you should have me back to do sometime, how you can affect the news. Generally, you follow the news. The news should be following you. And it's easy to do. And people who know how to do it run the news. You see stories all the time that say, General Electric announced today that blah, 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 blah. That's not news. That's General Electric's PR people deciding, let's announce this. And the media lapdogs just run it. They just run it. You can tell how good your press release is by how much they run it verbatim. And that's what I do. And that's what you should be doing. And very good point. Thank you. Uh, I was told that if you ever engage in a self-defense shooting, that the only thing you tell the police is that you stop the threat and then you wait for your lawyer. What do you think about talking to the police after a shooting without your lawyer? Boy, I should give you 10 bucks for that question because I'm writing a book on that very subject. 
What do you say if you're ever involved in a self-defense shooting? Well, first of all, you want to avoid a gunfight, not survive one. And you keep that in mind. If there's any way at all to avoid it, you do not want to get into one. Your life is on the line. You may have to kill somebody, and then you have the mark of Cain for the rest of your life. And the public may not get, may not get the real story of what happened. No, they'll get a story that crazed maniac from doctor convention kills two in apparent robbery attempt, and they were trying to rob you and you killed them. Right? That's the way the news stories will usually run. There is a severe legal risk to you in a self-defense event, so you don't want to get into one. And in fact, at the risk of being too commercial again, we sell several books on exactly this, the best one being In the Gravest Extreme, which has all sorts of ways to avoid a confrontation even with an armed person. Most lawyers will tell you that after a self-defense shooting, say nothing. That's the common wisdom, say nothing. That's impossible. You've just gone through the most traumatic event of your life, and the police come in and say, what happened? And here's your answer. Well, do you live here? Can I see some ID? You're going to stand there like an autistic automaton and say nothing? No, you're going to say a lot. You're going to be filled with a desire to speak and you'll get yourself in trouble. There's some great videos on the web of law professors showing you how seemingly innocent statements that you've, well, the guy broke in, I was in fear for my life, he was gonna kill me and I shot him. Well, you said I shot him, so you've now confessed to a homicide. Whether it's a justifiable homicide, you'll find out in two years and $100,000 later. But I was just being honest, the law should be on my side. Not the way it works. And the advice that's out there on this subject, I don't think is particularly good. They don't agree with each other, and I've developed a formula of my own, which I'll reveal to you here. You don't call the police. You call your lawyer. Most people figure dial 911. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think you're required to. And when you say, I want to speak to a lawyer, or I want to speak to my lawyer, the implication is you don't have a lawyer and now you're going to go shop for one while you're under a murder charge. If you have a gun and you think you may need a self-defense attorney, or if you have a gun, period, you should find a criminal defense attorney and here's how you do it. You ask at the local gun club, you ask at the gun show, you go to the gun association, you call the NRA or Gun Owners of America or the Second Amendment Foundation or really cool group, Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership, based in Milwaukee, and you tell them, I need to meet with a, a self-defense attorney, and you call the attorney, you tell them on the phone, I want to have an introductory consultation for an hour. Almost any lawyer will grant you this, and it'll cost you a couple hundred bucks, maybe $300 if the guy's really good. And you go in and ask him every gun question you have. You ask him the question you just asked, you see what he says. You see if you think he knows what he's doing. And whole list of questions. If you can't think them up, they'll be in this new book I'm <laughs> working on of what questions to ask. Then if you think he's good, you take six of his business cards. You put one in your glove box. You put one in your wallet. You put one in your desk. You give one to your wife. You have an extra one or two. Then if anything happens, you don't need an attorney. You call your attorney because now he knows you and you know him. And in fact, you could call him and ask him a question just because you had met. He's not going to bill you. You call up, hey, Tony, it's me, Bob. Listen, I was wondering, I was going to buy a gun from somebody. Can I just do that? Is that legal? And he gives you an answer over the phone and your friends and you take them to lunch. Now you have an attorney. And if you're involved in the shooting, you call him and under lawyer-client privilege, you say, Tony, some guy broke in and I shot him. You tell him the whole nine yards. That can't be revealed. And you have him call 911 from his cell phone while he's driving to your house so he gets there first. Then when the police come in and say what happened, your lawyer says something on the order of, my client will release a statement in writing in two weeks. The same approach the police take. When the police are involved in the shooting, they remove the guy from the scene, he goes on administrative leave for two weeks with pay, and then they release a statement in writing from a team of lawyers. You don't make a verbal statement. It's just too much opportunity to screw up. So there you go, now you don't have to buy that book, and it's gonna be a cheap one, it'll be pretty thin. But th did that do it?
Uh, just one plug for the uh, NRA. They have a magazine, the American Rifleman, and every month uh, it has a whole page of uh, self-defense uh, stories, vignettes from around the country, of exactly situations, and it's very interesting. Uh, just one comment. Uh, it seems to me that it takes the Second Amendment to protect the First Amendment. If we ever lose the Second Amendment, we won't long have the First. You, you could argue that we barely have the First Amendment now. Um, my next book, which is done but not published yet, is about all the things you're not allowed to say. Because you can get in trouble for telling jokes, for giving medical advice if you're not a doctor. You probably read about the FDA coming down on the cherry industry for saying cherries, well, tart cherries, are, are better at reducing pain than ibuprofen. And they shut down the industry for saying that. Now, the government gave them a grant to study the health effects of cherries to increase cherry sales. And they had peer review studies done that showed tart cherries have chemicals that are very effective at reducing pain. But when they promoted it, the FDA said, well, cherries aren't drugs. We regulate drugs. The only thing that works better than a drug is another drug. So you can't say that. And they shut them down. And they were very clever about it. They went after the cherry growers in Michigan. And then all the rest of the cherry industry got it, and they saved on postage. <laughs> the book is called Bomb Jokes at Airports and 186 Other Things You Better Not Say. I mean, you can't advertise an apartment with a picture window and a walk-in closet. It's against federal law because you could be discriminating against the blind or people who can't walk. <coughs> federal law. They have, in New York, they have textbooks that quote Bob Dylan, how many roads must a person walk down before you can call them a person? Because otherwise it's sexist. You're singling out men. They rewrite greatness. Well, that's a separate issue. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll see you at the gun show.